Hello, it's your boy, the one and only Sir Pat of the Department of Biology. And yes, it's me again. And today's topic would be on the muscular system. But before I start, I'd like to congratulate each and every one of you for surviving this far in this course and in this semester in UP Bio. Yeah, we have gone through a lot, a lot of lectures in a lot of a lot of online classes, a lot of pressure and stress. But a wise man once said that diamonds are made under pressure. So let's do this. Muscular system movement in animals. So for the lecture outline of today's lesson, we'll focus on the skeletal muscle contraction. First, we'll talk about the organization of a skeletal muscle. Then we'll move on to the muscular contraction proper, focusing on the concept of sliding filament theory. So recall from the lecture of Sir Dane on histology and the various types of tissues, we all he I mean he already have discussed the different types of tissues out there. We have your connective tissue, muscular, nervous, and so on and so forth. So we'll build up on that discussion for us to have a better understanding of your muscular system and skeletal muscle in particular. So on the organization of your skeletal muscle, um, each um, muscle, each muscle, imagine your biceps, for example. Your bicep, essentially, this is a skeletal muscle, right? And it has these three layers of connected tissue that encloses it. This connected tissue provides structures to the muscle and com kind of compartmentalize the muscle fibers within the muscle. So each muscle is wrapped in a, in a sheet of dense irregular connective tissue. We call this the epimysium. So this is the epimysium right here. So this is a dense irregular connective tissue and it separates you know, the muscle from other tissues and organs in the areas, allowing the muscles to move independently. Imagine your bicep moving independently of the tissues, the fats surrounding it. So the epimysium also allows the muscle to contract and move powerfully, maintaining all the while maintaining its structural integrity in the process. Okay? So inside your muscle, inside your muscle, you have different uh, components. You have artery, veins, and nerves. That's just a basic fact. But we have this, what we call bundles of muscle. We call that the fascicles. So inside each skeletal muscle, again, imagine your bicep, your, your muscle fibers are organized into what we call fascicles. So these fascicles are like bundles of joy, bundles of muscle fibers. So these fascicles are also surround, surrounded by a layer of connective tissue. We call this tissue the perimysium. So that's number one, epimysium. Another connective tissue here, the perimysium, okay? So we have your perimysium and <clears throat> and this um, fascicular organization no? is uh, surrounded by your middle layer of connective tissue. That's your perimysium. So there is this fascicular bundle organization that is common in the muscles, your skeletal muscles, and it allows for the your nervous system to trigger specific movements of a muscle by activating certain subset of that fascicle. No? <clears throat> so inside that fascicle, we have the what we call the muscle fiber. We have your muscle fibers. Your muscle fiber is the muscle cell. So this is the muscle cells. Okay. Okay, these are your muscle cells. Okay, the muscle fiber 
is also your muscle cell or you can also call it muscle fiber cell or myocytes right so essentially that's your muscle cell so as you can see here your muscle cell or your muscle fiber is a very elongated cell and that cell is surrounded no that cell is also surrounded by another layer of connective tissue we will call this one that's the third layer the endometrium okay so inside each fascicle inside each bundle you have numerous uh, muscle fibers or muscle cells or muscle fiber cells muscle muscle fiber cells <laughs> so you have a lot of muscle fibers inside those bundles those fascicles okay so those uh, muscle fibers are encased by a thin connective tissue this is a layer of collagen and reticular fibers so that is your endometrium so that is your endometrium hmm? surrounding each muscle fibers okay so this endometrium is made up of collagen and reticular fibers encasing the endometrium okay <clears throat> so those are the three layers of your connective tissues that wraps your muscle so again let's repeat it so this entire thing here is the muscle that muscle you have your fascia that, that is also a connective tissue near your tendon but the entire muscle is surrounded by your epimysium that's a connective tissue and then the bundles no the bundles here are called fascicles those fascicles are again wrapped by your perimysium it's another connective tissue and then again a single muscle muscle cell or a single muscle fiber cell or a muscle fiber you can just call it a muscle fiber it's again surrounded by another connective tissue this is your endometrium so epi that's the outermost peri the middle and the endo is the inner one huh? okay <clears throat> okay <clears throat> so again this is the muscle this is the muscle cell the muscle fibers are the muscle cells are the myocytes okay don't forget about that <clears throat> okay so oh yeah <clears throat> as you can see right here it um sir dane also mentioned that there is so aside from the shape no the long cylindrical and elongated shape of a muscle we also have what we call striations <clears throat> so striations we also have what we call striations so these are stripings no? alternate these are due to the alternating arrangement of your a and i bands okay so when we say a bands these are the dark darker bands okay or sometimes you call it disc or band it's, it's okay doesn't matter so your A bands are the darker bands. These are called A because the other name for this is your aniso, anisotropic bands. Okay. So aside from that, we also have your I. So your I bands or I disc are the lighter ones. Again, Sir Dane mentioned that these lighter ones are what we call the isotropic bands. Okay, so there's this alternating A and I bands in your muscle. That's why you can see that there are these stripes right here in your skeletal muscle. Because there is this alternating AI, AI bands. Oh, AI. <laughs> your artificial intelligence. Anyway, so you can also notice that there are, your nucleus are found on the periphery of your muscle fiber cells but aside from that remember from your lecture of from Sardane that there are different properties 
of your muscle fibers or your muscle cells. There is this contractility, extensibility, elasticity, but the main one that we need to discuss here is the excitability and property of your muscle cell or your muscular tissues. No? And that's mainly because of the presence of innervations. No? That's mainly due to innervations and you will see um, later uh, a lot of receptors inside your cell, muscle cell. But as you can see here, we have this what we call MEPs. No? Your MEPs are your motor entry points. So motor entry points. So these motor entry points are essentially muscular nerve endings. These are like intramuscular nerve endings. And these nerve endings, so as you can see here, this is a nerve bundle. So there's a lot of nerve bundled together. And they branch out and innervates, no? innervates your muscle fibers, no? different muscle fibers. It innervates your different muscle fibers right here. And by that, your brain have, can send signals to this nerve bundle and it can permeate the muscle. Therefore, exciting it and exhibiting voluntary control on the muscle no? for voluntary control and locomotion. So why am I talking about these uh, nerve bundles and these nerve endings, your axon terminal, your MEPs? Because at the ends of your axon, imagine you have your, your axon body, you have the dendrites, you have the axon, and you have multiple axon terminals. So in those portion, if we zoom that in, it will look something like this. We will have what we call your axon terminal. So this axon terminal, or sometimes you can call it synaptic knob. You can call it synaptic knob, or sometimes people call it the terminal button. Or sometimes you can also call it terminal bouton. <laughs> so all of those are referring to this portion right here. So this axon terminal or this synaptic knob is a pretty interesting uh, point of uh, muscular contraction or in the sense of mus muscular contraction. Because right here, your action potential, so imagine this is your axon, this is your um, nerve, huh? nerve cell, propagating the signal. So there is this action potential right there. So imagine your action potential, the action potential uh, propagating, and this uh, signal, so this electrical signal, we call it the action potential, will propagate down and it will go down to the nerve bundles and essentially will reach the end portion, this end portion of the axon terminal of your synaptic knob. And what will happen is that your axon terminal has what we call this synaptic vesicles or vesicles, no? terminal vesicles, you can call it that. But there are those vesicles, no? synaptic vesicles. And those vesicles contain neurotransmitters. So those vesicles contain neurotransmitters, especially for the case of muscular contraction, it has your acetylcholine uh, neurotransmitter. And what will happen is that when the action potential from the brain through the nerves, through the last portion, the action, ter the action terminal, the act uh, when the action potential or the electrical signal reach the axon terminal or the synaptic knob, what will happen is that this vesicle will release, acet will fuse here and release acetylcholine. And that will 
trigger again another cascade of reaction. You will see that earlier. For now, that's your accent terminal in your NEDs. Okay? <clears throat> Moving on. So, since we are, we are talking about the skeletal muscle fiber, again, your skeletal muscle fiber is the muscle cell, the muscle fiber cell, okay? These are your myocytes. So, in one skeletal muscle fiber, since it's a cell, it's a special cell, it's a muscle cell, because since it's also a cell, it also has what we call plasma membrane. When you have a plasma membrane, you will hear what we call the plasma lemma, lemma lemma, sarcolemma, and so on and so forth. So essentially, your sarcolemma is the specialized cell membrane or plasma membrane which surrounds these striated muscle fibers. No? So it has this special function. So we will, you will see that earlier, yeah, later. <coughs> Sorry. So essentially, your sarcolemma is equal to your plasma lemma. And again, remember when we say lemma lemma, those are your cell membrane, your plasma membrane, essentially. But it's just a fancy way of saying this is a plasma membrane or the cell membrane of your muscle cell, your muscle fibers, okay? <clears throat> so aside from sarcolemma, you can also call it myelema. That depends on you, but anyway, that's your sarcolemma. And your sarcolemma has a specialized function, okay? It has a specialized function because it is part of a special type of cell, a muscle cell. And it has what we call this transverse tubules. So your transverse tubules are these portions right here. Those are your transverse tubules. Okay, those are your T tubules. So later on, you will see the importance of these T tubules in the propagation of the action potential of the electrical signal earlier in the axon terminal. Okay, so that's your transverse tubule of your sarcolemma. Now, what is the sarcoplasm? Essentially, this is the cytoplasm. Okay? Remember, we have cytoplasm. We also have sarco sarcoplasm. So this is the, <coughs> when you say sarcoplasm, it's this, it, it can equate to cytoplasm. So essentially, it's the cytoplasm of your muscle cell. And your muscle cell has a different, <coughs> it has a different uh, components inside of your, inside of the cytoplasm. So your cytoplasm, essentially, for muscle cells, they are distinct because in your sarcoplasm, you can find lots of glycogen. And again, your glycogen is the main energy storage, main energy source. No? You can also see your glycogen in your liver. It's a, it kind of looks like this. No? So it, it is made up of glucose. No? Essentially, it's a multi-branch polysaccharide so many glucose repeating units it's just repeating units of glucose so it kind of looks like that so this is a multi-branch polysaccharide made up of glucose so you can so also see this in your liver and in your muscle cell so essentially you break down uh, you cleave and release the glucose molecule for energy you know, for energy that's that's the main purpose of your glycogen for energy storage Okay, so aside from glycogen, you can also find in your cytoplasm or your sarcoplasm your mitochondria. So you can see your mitochondria right here, right there, okay? And it's important to have those mitochondria right there for energy production. Remember, your muscle, mu muscle needs a lot of energy for contraction, for movement. That's why it needs to be there, okay? Aside from that, we also have what we call myoglobins. Myoglobins, just like your, uh, well, it's distantly related to your hemoglobin. And just like hemoglobin, myoglobin is a protein that binds oxygen. 
So usually uh, when doctors uh, scan your blood for levels of myoglobin, usually myoglobin spills out of the muscle fiber when there is severe muscle damage or when you are having a heart attack. So when there's a lot of myoglobin in your blood, that usually signals you are had you had a heart attack or that's a sign of severe muscle damage because usually your myoglobins are inside your uh, muscle no? inside your muscle cell your muscle fiber cell okay so when it spills out that's a signal that signals your doctor that you are having a heart attack or you had a severe uh, muscular damage. So those are your myoglobin. Essentially, it only binds uh, oxygen molecules. No? <coughs> okay, <coughs> so aside from that, you also have the lipofusion pigment, lipofuskin, no? lipofusion pigment inside of your site, inside your muscle cell, in your sarcoplasm. And usually, uh, scientists call this the wear and tear pigment. And usually, the concentration of your lipopushion pigment increases with age inside the muscle cell. Okay? <clears throat> and then next, aside from the sarcoplasm, we'll talk about the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So as you can see right here, it says terminal cisterna of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So what is the sarcoplasmic reticulum? So <clears throat> as you can see here, let's, uh, let's move on to the next portion. Right here, <clears throat> yeah. So what are your sarcoplasmic reticulum? What is the function of T tubules? Why are these two important? So let's zoom on them right here. So first of all, your transverse tubule, again, these are these transverse no? tubes. It transverse, no? no? <laughs> it has this transverse orientation. So essentially, as you can see it right here, your transverse tubules runs, no? Runs perpendicular to the orientation of your muscle, <coughs> your of your muscle, no? of especially of this component right here. Okay, so it runs perpendicular to that, and these transverse tubule usually is located at the center of the triad, no? usually at the A and I junctions. So as you can see here, one transverse tubule, another transverse tubule. It runs on the junction right here of your, again, your dark band and your lighter bands. So your transverse tubule is usually located at the center of this AI junction. No? And aside from that, your sarcoplasmic reticulum naman has this, what we call, reticulated pattern. No? So it, it looks like a net-like pattern. That's why we call it reticulated python. And that's why we call it sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it has a somewhat reticulated net-like uh, function here. And that's important because later on, you will see that calcium gets to be dispersed. No? in this sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it needs to have that high surface area. It also needs to have high surface area to permeate all the, all the parts of your muscle fiber cell. So this is a well-developed cisterna in triad with your, again, in triad with your sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so these net-like patterns here and the presence of this transverse tubule here important for the propagation of again your action potential your action potential later on you will see the entire cascade of the signal transduction in muscular contraction <coughs> okay 
Moving on. So remember, transverse tubule is still part of your sarcolemma. Uh, yeah. The sarcoplasmic reticulum. We'll talk about that uh, later. So those two are pretty important. Okay. Again, notice how the sarcoplasmic reticulum permeates all the components, all these rod shapes here. Okay, and those rod shapes are important too. We'll talk about that later. So, <clears throat> again, the T tubules and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, in that T tubules, kasi, we have what we call um, receptors, no? receptors and channels. <clears throat> so these receptors and channels, we'll call them the uranidine receptor and the hydropyridine receptor. So located in the lateral sac in your sarcoplasmic reticulum are your uranidine receptors. So uranidine receptors together with your calcium release channels, huh? so we call this the food proteins, what they do are, is they are responsible for the release of calcium 2 plus, you know, for the release of the calcium 2 plus from the internal stores during excitation contraction coping. So we, you will see later that they are important in the release of the calcium 2 plus. On the other hand, your in your T tubules, so this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, in your T tubules, man. Located naman dyan yung mga DHPR, the dihydropyridine receptors. These uh, naman are voltage-dependent calcium channels. So essentially, they have a voltage sensor na natitrigger sila. No? Pag natrigger sila ng voltage change, magkakaroon ng sila magtitrigger ng intracellular calcium release. No? Again, part sila ng excitation contraction coping. Part sila ng <coughs> sulot na lang din at excitation okay <coughs> so remember remember let's imagine it how does maybe now you're being you're being overwhelmed by the number of uh, <coughs> number of um uh, call this terms and words <laughs> that we're using here. The HPR, ano nga ba yan? Rayano Dean, ba't ang magdaming ganyan? Europa May. <laughs> anyway, so, again, remember, we have your terminal button or terminal button, the axon terminal. So, we, let's just call this the sy synaptic knob. So, remember, you have your synaptic knob. Again, that's just the same with accent terminal, that's just the same with terminal button, that's just the same with terminal button, synaptic knob. So essentially, you have your synaptic knob right there, and you will have what we call your sarcolemma. Okay? Again, sarcolemma is the the cell membrane, yes, the plasma membrane of your muscle fiber cell. So this is your sarcolemma. That's the synaptic knob. This is the sarcolemma. <coughs> and in that sarcolemma, uh, in the synaptic knob, you have your synaptic vesicle. So those are your synaptic vesicles. And this uh, portion right here, we will call this the synaptic cleft. So, it's a cleft. It's called a cleft because it's a space, no? Space, yeah. yeah. And these are your synaptic vesicles, the man. <clears throat> Again, this uh, synaptic nub right here is still part, no? It's still, it's the end portion of your nerve. Remember? Your nerve. That's the end portion of your nerve. That synaptic knob right there is the end portion 
of your NURB. Okay? <coughs> so it's the end portion of your NURB. So it will release when the act when this action potential, when the electrical signal reaches that synaptic knob, that action terminal. What will happen is the vesicle right here, the synaptic vesicle, will release its component, its neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, in your synaptic cleft. Okay, and what will happen is that in this <coughs> in this synaptic cleft, you have what we call receptors. So these are acetylcholine receptors. Okay, so <coughs> your acetylcholine receptor, again from the name itself, it will kind of kind of receive you know, or kind of respond to the presence of acetylcholine so what will happen is the acetylcholine that is released in the synaptic in the synaptic cleft will bind to the acetylcholine receptor <coughs> and then will propagate the action potential downward so what will happen here is that ac that action potential will cross this transverse tubule <clears throat> okay it will transverse that transfer it will traverse <laughs> it will traverse that transverse tubule okay <clears throat> so if if the action potential reaches here and since you have your dihydropyridine receptor your ryanodine receptor your put proteins right here they are triggered by that action potential <clears throat> and when that action potential reaches them it will trigger them to release calcium 2 plus essentially so that's what's happening <clears throat> when the action potential reaches them what will happen essentially what will happen here is the release of calcium 2 plus so that's your action potential going here when that action potential reaches this it will trigger the release of calcium 2 plus in the lateral sac of your sarcoplasmic reticulum essentially in the sarcoplasmic reticulum <clears throat> okay 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 so that, is that clear i hope that's clear <clears throat> moving on right here so, whew, <clears throat> I know, right? It's a lot of terms, but it's, it's, I think it's pretty simple up until this point. It's still pretty simple. So, <clears throat> let's talk about the anatomy of your skeletal muscle fiber. So, your skeletal muscle fibers is usually composed of your myofibrils and sarcomeres. Okay, your myofibrils are earlier, as you can see here, <clears throat> so this is the muscle fiber cell no? and the myofibrils are the rod-like organelle no? this is the rod-like org organelle that I was talking about inside your muscle cell <clears throat> that's your myofibrils so that's the rod-like organelle inside the muscle cell so these are pretty numerous no? these are the most predominant structural feature inside the muscle fiber cell so essentially, these rod-like organelles, these myofibrils, are the specialized contractile element that usually constitute about the 90% of the volume of the muscle fiber. Your myofibrils are, again, cylindrical in nature. No? And these myofibrils are super important because the greater the number of myofibrils in your in, in a muscle cell in a muscle cell the greater the number of myofibrils the greater <coughs> the the greater the force no the greater the force that you can uh, th that you can produce no? so the greater the myofibril volume the greater the force that's why bulkier guys have yeah that has a larger um, muscle volume 
can produce and exert a lot more force than thinner guys no <clears throat> so those are your myofibrils and your PE teachers will tell you that usually the volume of the muscle fiber will will tell you how much force it can exert and another one sir yung sarcomere what are the sarcomeres again the sarcomeres ito naman yung tinatawag natin the contracting the basic contracting unit okay <clears throat> this is the contracting unit so from the nape itself pag sinabi mong sarco ano yan eh flesh flesh sarco pag ano yan flesh yung ibig sabihin niya pag meros naman no parang part no flesh part yan so your sarcomeres are your smallest functional unit of a striated muscle tissue so essentially <clears throat> these are your contracting unit no this is the basic contracting unit of a muscle of a muscle tissue so these are repeating units so your your one myofibrils has repeating units of your sarcomeres okay so now let's zoom in and let's talk about the more detailed sarcomere right here so we're zooming in so this is again a portion of your myofibril so inside the muscle cell there is this organelle elongated organelle the myofibrils numerous man myofibrils inside just one muscle fiber cell and a por in that portion of a myofibril you can see a repeating unit of your sarcomeres so your sarcomere is the functional unit of the skeletal muscle it's the contracting unit of the skeletal muscle it can be defined by your z line what we call the z line Okay, <clears throat> so one sarcomere is from one Z line to another Z line. Okay, Z line or Z disc, we call it Z line or Z disc. Let's just put it here. Okay, again, we still have your A bond right here and your I bond right here, your anisotropic and your isotropic band, the lighter band and the darker band. And these bands the lightness and the darkness of this bond your a band and i band is actually due to the filament that is predominant in those area so the thick filament myosin is the one that is causing the darker a band so it's because it's composed your a band is composed of your thicker myosin filament Okay, that's why it's darker. A band darker because of myosin, the thick myosin filament. <clears throat> now, your I band, on the other hand, has lighter color because of the thin, thin naman siya, na actin filament. The majority of your I band, no? Is due is composed of your actin filament right here. Okay, that's why it's lighter, man. So your I band is lighter because of the that actin filament composing it. Okay. Now, let's zoom in on the sarcomere structure and what are the following regions of that sarcomere. <coughs> okay, as you can see here, this is one sarcomere again a sarcomere. Is from one Z line or Z disc to another Z disc. So essentially, your myofibril is composed of repeating units of sarcomeres, repeating sarcomere, no, it's repeating functional units of sarcomere. And in that sarcomere, there is this thing that we call M line. So your M line extends vertically downward in the middle of your A bond. Okay. Aside from the N, M line, we also have what we call the H zone. So the H zone naman is the lighter area in the middle of the A bond where thin filaments do not reach. Okay, So your thin filaments here do not reach the H zone. You will see that er, uh, later that your H zone disappears when your muscle is at full contractions. Huh? Because this... Um, 
actant filaments will slide in and will cover that H zone. Okay? So, <clears throat> again, we have your A bond. Your A bond is uh, darker in color because there's the overlap you know, of your thick and thin filament and you also have your thick filament right there. Your I bond is the remaining portion of the thin filament that does not project from the A bond. So the lighter portion right here. So it doesn't have the thick myosin filament there. So A bond, I bond, H zone, M line, Z, -li, Z line, Z disc, those are your portions of your sarcomere. And again, there are these two filament, no? There's this, um, within this uh, structure, we have the most important proteins that we need to remember. That's your contractile proteins, your myosin, and your actin filament. So again, let's zoom in on these structures. Let's zoom in in this myosin, in this thick and thin filament. So the primary structural component of the thick filament is your myosin. No? That's your thick filament, the myosin. And <coughs> your myosin, my, your myosin, your myosin, no? The thick filament has two identical subunits. So it has these two identical subunits that are intertwined no? in a helical fashion together. And it has two heads right here. So as you can see here, there are two portions, the head and the tail portion. Okay? The glo we, you have your two globular head that is shaped like a golf club. No? and it has this intertwined uh, tail ends so again your tail is right here your head is right here on that head no? on that head portion it's very important to note this you have uh, two sites located on those heads you have what we call the actin binding site and the myosin ATPase site later on the purpose of those will come to life. No? Actin binding site and myosin ATP site. So essentially your myosin, imagine your myosin as a as a pro contractile protein and also an enzyme slash no. It's, it, it functions like a contractile protein structurally and it has this um, enzyme enzyme-like properties too because of this head portion, okay? So, yep, it has the tail end, the globular heads, and the fashion that it is arranged is that your myosin molecules are attached, no? oriented at the center filament, so they're attached together, and you have this protruding uh, globular heads no? that project at one end. So essentially your globular heads uh, protrude outward at the regular inter intervals. Now, these are your globular heads. So this is how they are arranged together, making up your thick filament. Okay, so that's your thick filament. The next um, contractile protein that we'll talk about is the actin. So again, the primary structural component of the thin filament is your actin. Okay, so your actin, <coughs> of course, is made up of actin molecules. No? So these actin molecules right here are spherical in shape. And as you can see here, you have what we call the binding site for attachment of your myosin. That's why uh, last time we have that green portion, the actin binding site. That's the site. That's the site where these Myosin, the myosin and the actin the, and the actin binds to each other during contraction process. So the components of your actin filament, the thin filament, is you also have what we call the tropomyosin and the troponin. <clears throat> so your again here, as you can see here, your actin molecules are 
joined together into two strands now we have two strands right here we will call this the actin helix and <clears throat> aside from that you have your tropomyosin and the troponin so what will happen is your tropomyosin will kind of like guide no it's like a thread like molecule that guide or blocks no? <clears throat> or covers the actin binding site okay so the, that actin binding site right here are covered or blocked by your tropomyosin okay so your tropomyosin is the thread-like molecule that binds that blocks or cover the actin bind, binding site of your actin molecules of your individual actin molecules your troponin on the other hand is the three polypeptide no, it is, it is composed of your three polypeptide located at specific interval of your um, <coughs> of your uh, your thin filament, and and uh, your these three polypeptide binds to specific uh, things. No, the first one no binds to the tropomyosin. So the first one binds to the tropomyosin. Okay. The next one binds to the actin molecule, and the next one binds to calcium. So your troponin binds to three things. The first one is the tropomyosin. <coughs> Aside from that, it also binds to the actin molecules and it also binds to calcium molecules together these two the troponin and the tropomyosin forms the troponin tropomyosin complex no? <clears throat> troponin tropomyosin complex and together these three looks like this and this is your thin filament okay is that okay so again you have the actin helix made up of actin molecules that are wound to each other you have the tropomyosin tropomyosin troponin complex i'm sorry troponin tropomyosin complex that goes around here like that with the tropomyosin blinding or binding or covering the active no? the binding site no? for your myosin right here <clears throat> of your actin molecules okay so that's important it's pretty important what is the role of calcium in the cross bridge formation what is the role of calcium in cross bridge formation nga ba? wait ano nga ba yung cross bridge formation yan so nagkakaroon ng cross bridge when your myosin binds with the actin okay because remember we have your binding site of your actin molecule we also have the binding side of the actin of the myosin here no? so they both have the binding site so but during the relaxed phase of your muscle your troponin and your tropomyosin right here this rope like structure right here blocks or covers that binding site so during the relaxed state of your muscle there is no cross bridge formation these two doesn't bind to each other your myosin and actin but remember calcium can bind to your troponin molecule when there is calcium and there's action potential and calcium is released in the muscle what will happen is calcium will bind to your troponin and it will create structural changes on the troponin therefore therefore it will change its shape no? and it will allow your tropomyosin to slide away from its blocking position now with the tropomyosin out of the way your <coughs> your your actin and myosin head can now bind to each other 
and form the cross bridge. Okay, so again, <clears throat> during the relaxed state, tropomyosin covers this rope like structure right here, covers the myosin binding site. So your myosin head cannot bind directly to actin because tropom troponin this structure right here its main function is to stabilize this tropomyosin into its blocking position this rope like structure into its blocking position <coughs> thus blocking the actin and inhibiting the cross bridge formation no but when calcium is released during excited phase, no? once the muscle is excited, calcium will be released and this calcium will bind to the troponin molecule. When it binds to the troponin molecule, it will change the shape of your troponin molecule and thus it will allow the tropomyosin to slide away from its blocking position. Okay, once the tropomyosin slides away from its blocking position, it will expose this binding site and thus allowing your myosin head to bind to the actin binding site, forming now your cross bridge. That's why calcium is important during contraction process. That's also the reason why when you have electrolyte depletion, you can get cramps, one of the reasons. <clears throat> so that's why earlier we talked about the transverse tubule and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Because in this sarcoplasmic reticulum, the release of calcium happens. And that calcium is important for the propagation of the action potential to your myofibrils. Okay, now let's talk about the mechanism of contraction. Well, the first step of contraction process for a skeletal muscle is the excitation phase. So this happens on the neuromuscular junction. Remember the axon terminals, the terminal buttons, buttons, small swelling, no? <clears throat> the synaptic uh, nub right there, right here, this one. So, but before we go here, Let's uh, trace back, way, way back further on the nerve that caused that axon potential. So again, this is your nerve. It has your dendrites. It has your axon. Okay, this is the axon. It has your axon terminals right here. Many axon terminals. Okay. So again, this portion is this one. It is an enlarged portion. Okay? <clears throat> so what happens here is that, again, we are talking about your action potential. So there is that action potential. There is that electrical signal. No? But... How does that action potential gets to be created? So let's talk about the resting membrane potential. Potential. Resting membrane potential. So normally your normally your membrane, no? The membrane of your nerves right here is negatively charged normally it is negatively charged as you can see right here it's negatively charged okay so we call that the resting membrane potential it has a negative charge of 70 millivolts but when certain things arise when your brain thinks about moving no <clears throat> what happens is that there is this what we call channels. 
Specifically, this channel is what we call the sojung channel. So this is the a Na plus channel. This Na channel is a voltage gated channel, meaning when there are changes in voltage in millivolts, it will allow certain molecules to pass in. So again, the resting membrane potential is at negative 70. Negatively charged ang ating, uh, yan, yung ating membrane potential. Negatively charged. Now, what will happen when condition arise, no? na sinabi ni brain na mag-send na ng signal, ang mangyayari kay sodium channel natin mag-open. No? When there's voltage changes, so this sodium channel will open up. And it will allow the entry of your sodium. Now, sodium will come in, come, will rush in because negatively charged tong sa loob, papasok yan ang papasok. At ang mangyayari, magiging positive yung ating um, membrane. At doon na nagsisimula yung action potential. No? Usually, nag-overshoot yan sa positive 30 or positive 30 or positive 40 millivolts yung charge niya. Ngayon, that positive charge will move and move down downstream <laughs> down your um down down your axle but the propagation here is not a simple movement of this uh this charge this positive charge across the axon what happens actually in that axon let's zoom it in in here there is this what we call covering of your axon so again this is the body this is the knobs the cell body there is this what we call myelin sheet again remember so this one right here that's the covering that's your myelin sheet that is your myelin sheet right here so these are your fatty coverings of your of your uh, axon okay in that myelin sheet as mentioned by sir Dane, so we have your myelin sheet so these are your fatty coverings lipid coverings of your <coughs> your axon so those are your myelin sheets. In that myelin sheet, so the myelination is not complete. There are portions of your axon that doesn't have any myelin. We call that portion the nodes of Ranvier. And why am I talking about this? <coughs> it's important in the propagation of the signal. Remember your action potential right here. It doesn't move simply like this no doesn't propagate like this all the time what happens is if there is a rush of positive uh, charge here of sodium here what will happen is due to that myelination the action potential will jump and jump and jump okay we call that jumping or the conduction of your signal in that way a saltatory conduction saltatory meaning it's a jumping no? there's a jumping of signal here okay the action potential that was created right here on the surge inside of your sojum will be transducted through saltatory conduction okay so the positive signs here will move here and will move here and so on and so forth until it reaches this portion okay until the signal reaches the portion of your this what we call this this structure right here the neuromuscular junction or the synaptic knob or the axon terminal or the terminal button or the terminal button okay so what will happen when that action potential reaches that terminal knob what will happen is that okay when this action potential reaches that that portion 
calcium with the action potential again that the charge no the positive charge no the positive action potential reaches the end portion it will signal these channels right here these calcium channels right here to allow calcium to go in go inside and when calcium is inside it will bind to the synaptic vesicle and it will signal the synaptic vesicle to release their content to the space right here we call this space again the synaptic cleft okay <clears throat> so when what are the what are these things that are released in the synaptic cleft these are your ACH <clears throat> okay your acetylcholine neurotransmitters so these are your neurotransmitter okay those are your neurotransmitter okay <coughs> when your acetylcholine is released here what will happen is it will bind to the acetylcholine receptors here <clears throat> after binding to the acetylcholine receptor sodium will again rush in and another action potential and not another and an action potential is then propagated all throughout no may sodium channels kana naman na mag open pasok may positive charge na action potential maki create okay pero dun na to sa ating sarco sarcolemma sarcolemma na natin to okay again let's repeat <clears throat> the signal from the brain will reach that that um, that nerve and what will happen when that signal reaches it it will cause no the sodium to rush in and when that sodium rush in an action potential will be created and that signal will be transducted but that signal will not be transducted like this Will be be transducted saltatorily, no? May saltatory conduction ka dyan, nagja jump yung signal mo through that nodes of Randier until it reaches the terminal, no? The axon terminal. When it reaches the axon terminal, what will happen is it will signal the calcium channels to let calcium in. When that calcium is inside, it will signal the release of your neurotransmitter in that synaptic vesicle outside the synaptic cleft. This neurotransmitter acetylcholine will bind to your acetylcholine receptor in your sarcoplasmic reticulum, ay, sarcoplasmic, in your sarcolemma, no? it will bind to this um, receptor right here and what will happen is after the uh, acetylcholine receptor binds is your your sodium will go in again and it will again propagate an action the action potential in your sarcolemma okay so that's the excitation process okay the excitation process that we're talking about here just starts in this uh, portion here in this portion here it doesn't really include this it just uh, involved it because uh, we're talking about action potential so yeah that's the excitation proper but again remember huh? this uh, nerve this nerve no this specific nerve right here that i'm talking about this nerve is the nerve from your spine remember because again the signal from the brain will transduct to the spine and that nerve nerve bundles from the spine will uh, go to your body and towards the innervate the muscles and this is the muscle and this is the nerve portion innervation so that's how it's happening okay uh, again if you are you are talking about the yes we are talking about your acetylcholine baka makalimutan nyo kung anong itsura niya or anong spelling niya ACH lang kasi nilalagay ko short na siya shortcut natin acetylcholine Baka, baka lang maano natin, no? Siya yung neurotransmitter na ginagamit natin dito. 
Okay, so this is the excitation process. No, this is the entire excitation process. The signal comes from the brain, it goes to your spine. What happens in that action potential is just your sodium ions. No, in general, speaking in general, it's just your sodium ions rushing in, creating a positive charge in that in that uh, portion of your nerve and that will essentially transduct downward the axon but the transduction is not a simple transduction there's a trans saltatory conduction that is happening because your fatty myelin sheet covering here will insulate those nerves no? will insulate those nerves it, it kind of acts like a rubber no and it doesn't allow charges to move to it through it so what happens is your charges will then jump and that's good because due to this jumping uh, process the signal transduction gets a way bit faster you know, than a normal conduction like this because of this saltatory conduction the signal gets faster and that's important because remember you are moving Remember, you are moving. You need to move. Imagine yourself touching a very hot object. No, that's uh, the split second difference is fairly important. Whether you get damaged, burnt skin or not. Okay, so that saltatory conduction is important to hear. So the next space in the contraction process is the excitation contraction coupling. Here. We will talk about the purpose or the importance of your tissue bills again in your sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, <clears throat> again, in the synaptic terminal, in the axon terminal, in the terminal button or terminal button, the synaptic <clears throat> nub, what will happen is the charge, no? the sodium charge, no? the action potential will propagate again when it reaches the terminal nub or the synaptic nub. Calcium will enter in and it will trigger the release of your acetyl acetylcholine in those synaptic vesicles. Your acetylcholine will bind to the receptor in your sarcoplasmic uh, <coughs> sarcolemma. When it binds to the sarcolemma, again, another action potential, uh, the action potential is then transferred, kumbaga. So action potential will then propagate through this sarcolemma, the cell membrane of your muscle fiber cell, and it will propagate down the T-tubules. When that action potential reaches the transverse tubule, remember we have the receptors here, no? the DHPR, the rayanodine, and the hydro. Yep those receptors the, those food proteins earlier <coughs> when the action potential reaches those receptors it will trigger no, those um reanodine and the hydropyridine receptor it will trigger the release of calcium in your sarcoplasmic reticulum so when the action potential reaches here it will trigger the receptors in here those two receptors since they are voltage gated receptors it will trigger the release of calcium and remember the sarcoplasmic reticulum is net like in shape so it it uh, it is well developed and well net like pattern because it's important for increasing the surface area and permeating the entire microfibrils inside no, the or the, the contracting organelles inside the myofibrils inside your muscle fiber cell so when calcium <coughs> gets released from your sarcoplasmic reticulum, the excitation contraction coupling is indeed complete. So remember, the action potential moves through the sarcolemma. No? The action potential moves to the sarcolemma right here and into the interior of the transverse tubule, triggering the release of the calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and into the skeletal <clears throat> into 
the myofibrils that is right next okay and again <laughs> and again and again and again those calcium will now bind to the troponin and when that calcium binds to that troponin it will create changes in structural configuration of the troponin molecule therefore allowing the tropomyosin the rope-like thing here that binds or that blocks the myosin binding site no? this binding site right here to move aside no? to move away allowing now the formation of cross bridge between your myosin head and your actin subunits <clears throat> okay so the excitation contraction coupling ends with the release and that calcium is important in the contraction process right here <clears throat> okay so we have the excitation okay what happens again paulit ulit tayo action potential lang yan no action potential from the brain to the spine to the terminal knob synaptic knob no will stimulate will stimulate the muscle <coughs> okay <coughs> the action potential will move through the sarcolemma through the transverse tubules and it will trigger the release of calcium and the calcium will now be attached here no? will be attached to the troponin pag nag attach na sa troponin <coughs> mag allow si sa attachment ng ating myosin head at yung actin subunit that's the stage 1 no? the stage 2 is the release and the binding of ATP the stage 3 is the bending no? so the bending phase magbibend lang siyang slightly and then when your sab sabi natin kanina again si myosin head no? may dalawa siyang site meron siyang actin binding site at meron din siyang ATPase binding site no? para siyang may enzyme activity kasi magbabind sa kanya yung ATP na yan at kapag nagbind na yung ATP na yan ibibreakdown niya si ATP into ADP at alam natin na high energy molecule si ATP at yung ATP na yan kapag sinira or binroken down mo or binroken down mo yung phosphate uh, phospho uh, yung phospho bond doon, no? yung mga phosphate na nakabond together, di ba tatlong phosphate yan, pag binrate down mo yun, mag-release ka ng energy. At yung energy na na-release doon, ang magkakos ng force generation na to. Parang nyo, ipupuliin niya yan. Okay? Yun nga pala, medyo bendable din kasi yung, uy, oh, bendable. No, hindi, hindi ito yung bendable na ano. Yung medyo bendable kasi itong lighter uh, part. No? lighter part na to yung parang neck ng ating ah, myosin at importante yun sa force generation so meron kang parang mangyayaring power stroke dyan so magkakaroon ka ng force generation power stroke after the power stroke is marireattach siya so parang kapag hindi pa nawala yung calcium 2 plus na nandyan kakabig lang yan ang kakabig magpa power stroke ng power stroke okay Okay, so again, stage 1 is attachment, next is release, binding of ATP, next is the bending, force generation, yun na yung power stroke na tinatawag natin, after the power stroke, mag attach ulit sila, and then ATP again, and repeat the process. So, itong process na to, ang, Ang tawag natin dito, no, ay yung theory na underlying process ng contraction is yung tinatawag nating sliding filament theory. So according sa sliding filament theory na to, yung ating mga myosin filament na ay sorry, yung mga myosin filament na to, may mga heads ka diyan. Okay? Ay nag-slide pass dun sa mga actin filaments na nandito. Okay? <coughs> Nga pala, may mga titan molecules ka din dyan. Ito mga titan molecules naman na to, baka nagtataka kayo kung anong purpose nila. Um, ang titan, no? imagine nyo yung tenga nyo, yan, 
kalamitan ng ano dyan, connected na tissue ay made up of titan. At medyo elastic yan si titan. El el Napaka-elastic yan na protein molecule. So, yun yung elasticity yung binibigay nyo dyan sa konteksto ng muscular contraction. So, again, balik tayo dun sa sliding filament theory. Yung sliding filament theory, ano lang yun? Theory na nagsasabi na during contraction, yung mga thick myosin filament natin, ng mga my heads, nag-slide pass dun sa mga thin na actin filaments during contraction. So, in turn, nasa-shorten during contraction yung muscle mo. Ju, kaya, kaya siya nasa-shorten during contraction kasi meron kang pag-slide pass through. No? Pag-slide pass through ng actin filament dun sa myosin filament. No, para siya nag-slide past each other. Okay? <coughs> Kaya ayan. Kung titignan nyo din, dito sa case natin dito, <coughs> nawawala yung H zone, yung lighter band here, during full contraction. Kasi nga, nag-slide past together. No? Nag-slide past yung mga thin, actin filament dun sa myosin thick filament na nandyan. So, therefore, parang nawala si, si H zone mo. So, ganito yung magiging mga question nyo dyan sa exam. No? Anong purpose ni calcium? No? Again, si calcium nag-bind sa troponin, shifting the actin filaments. No? Datanggalin niya si tropomyosin na ma-expose na tuloy yung binding site. Diba? Si myosin naman, mag-perform na ng cross beach kapag wala na yung naka nakaharang na si tropomyosin. Tapos magpupul na sila towards the center. And of course, that requires ATP. Ngayon, <coughs> kung titignan niyo ulit dito, di ba? Kung mapapansin niyo, may umiikli, may nawawala, may nagstay the same. Di ba? Di ba, di ba, di ba? Kung mapapansin nyo. Okay? So, si H zone, nawawala siya after contraction. No? Compare nyo yung relax sa may contraction. Si H zone mo, nawala dito. Okay? Yung I band mo, umik peding pag full contracted nawala parang nawala si I band mo di ba Pero si A band andiyan pa rin parehas pa rin yung length niya So si A band mo medyo nagsho-shorten yan Kasi I sorry si I band mo nagsho-shorten kasi nga nag-slide pass through di ba nag-slide pass through yan ay na yan <coughs> So in your fully contracted sarcomere parang nagsho-shorten or nawawala si A band Pero yung Si I, sorry. <laughs> Nabubulul na ako. So, nawawala si I band, yung lighter band. Pero yung A band na yan, parehas pa rin. Si Z disc mo, parehas pa rin. Si M line mo, andyan pa rin. No? Yung sarcomere mo, yung entire sarcomere mo, ano? nawawala or, eh, sorry, tumiliit din. No? Katulad din ni I. Si H band mo, nawawala din. H zone, sorry. Umiikli or nawawala. Pero si A band mo, stay the same. Si Z disc mo yung M line, parehas lang yan. Okay ba? <coughs> so, ganito yung mga lalabas na question sa exam nyo. Mga ganyan yung kailangan nyo intindihin. I-compare nyo yung relax at contracted na muscle. Dito, sa contracted na muscle, nawawala si H zone. Or pwedeng umikli lang kapag hindi fully contracted, di ba? Si sarcomere mo naman, umiikli din. Or pwedeng, hindi pwedeng mawala syempre. Pero umiikli siya kasi nga, nag-slide pass through. Tapos parang nawawala yung eye band mo. Si eye band mo, pwede din parang mawala siya kasi nga nag-slide pass through. Or umikli kapag hindi fully contracted. Pero yung A mo na bandyan will stay the same no matter what. Kasi hanggang dyan lang siya magmove. 
hanggang dun lang sa thick filament na yan. Okay? So, that's the contraction phase, sliding filament theory. Ngayon, importante naman na na ma-relax din, no? Hindi na puro contracted lang lagi yung muscle mo. Importante na merong relaxation phase na mangyari. So, paano naman na-achieve ng muscle yung relaxation phase? It, ito na yung dulong process ng ating dulong slide na to. No? So, paano nga ba na-achieve yung relaxation phase na yan? So, again, <clears throat> so, ayan, nag-contract na, may calcium, so on so forth, power stroke. So, yung relaxation ng muscle can only be accomplished by the sarcoplasmic reticulum via the following. Okay? So, si sarcoplasmic reticulum mo, gagawin niya, yung calcium na na-release dito, ipapump back niya yan through the use of calcium 2 plus ATPase pump. So, kaya siya tinawag na calcium 2 plus kasi calcium 2 plus yung pinaplus niya, yung pinapump niyan back. So, yung mga na-release na calcium dito, ipapump back mo. No? Ayan, may mga calcium pump ka dyan. Ipapump back mo dun sa sarcoplasmic reticulum. At ang kag kagandahan dito, kailangan mo pa rin ng energy. No? Kailangan mo ng energy para ibalik yan, yung mga calcium at pump back dun sa sarcoplasmic reticulum natin. Kaya hindi na yung mitochondria natin to provide that energy. Next, gumagamit pa tayo ng tinatawag nating calcequestrin. Calcequestrin. So yung calcequestrin naman natin, ito yung main calcium binding protein of your sarcoplasmic reticulum. So importante kasi yung calcequestrin na to kasi binabind niya yung ating sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, para siyang important regulator ng, regulator ng calcium 2 plus concentration. Kasi isipin mo, madami, actually, madami pang ibang klase ng calcium uh, proteins na nagbabind ng calcium, pero ito yung pinaka uh, dominant or abundant sa skeletal and cardiac muscle ng mammalian na, na mga organism. At ang kagandahan dito, pag may calcequestrin ka dyan sa dyan sa sarcoplasmic reticulum mo, inaalaw niya yung pag-concentrate, no? Nung pag-concentrate ng calcium 2 plus. So, kung iisipin nyo, yung sa sarcoplasmic reticulum mo, pwede niyang mag-concentrate si calcium up to 20 millimolars of concentration. Bounded to the calcequestrin, okay? Pero, yung free, yung unbound, nagre-remain yan at 1 millimolar. So, parang free pa rin yan dyan na naka-float. Pero, yung majority ng calcium nakabind kay cal calcequestrin. So, anong importance nito? Bakit nga parang nagsiserve siya as storage, no? Yung mga calcequestrin na nagbabind na calcium, parang siyang storage capacity, no? Nung ating... <coughs> no ating uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. At importante yun, kasi kung iisipin nyo, hindi naman basta-basta isang contraction lang yung ginagawa ng muscle mo. Diba? Sumasayo-sayo ka pa, kung ano pa nang ginagawa mo sa computer shop, nag or sa TikTok, mga ganyan. No? <clears throat> At doon yung makikita yung importance nito. Kung walang nagbabind kay calcium, no? laging 1 molar lang yun nandyan, wala itong 20 molar na nakabang kay calcequestrin. Isang, isang ano lang, isang random lang, no? Pagod ka na agad, or hindi ka na agad makakontract. Isang random lang, ubus na yung calcium na pinump mo out. Tapos, matagalan kasi ito, ha, yung pag-pump back. Hindi ito basta-basta. Yan, kapag meron kang calcequestrin na nandyan, mamimaintain na 1 molar yung concentration. At pwede ka pang mag-concent, mag, mag, mag contract ulit, mag-contract na mag-contract. So, dahil dyan sa calcequestrin na yan, nagkakaroon ka ng ability to contract no? frequently without uh, fatigue, no? minimal rundown dun sa tension ng <coughs> calcium concentration mo. Okay? So, ganun ka importante si calcequestrin. Ngayon naman, punta na tayo dun sa acetyl cholinesterase. So, ito naman, importante din to, no? na mawala tong signal na to. Kapag may signal ka pa rin dyan, na nandyan, na hindi mawawala, mawala-wala. 
'di ba? Kung maalala nyo sa excitation phase natin, kung meron ka pa ring neurotransmitter dito, wala, magpo-produce siya na magpo-produce ng action potential. Magta-travel sa sarcopla- sarcolema, magta-travel sa tissue, mag continually release ng calcium. At pangit yun, no? May signal ka lagi ng signal na mag-contract na mag-contract. Mahihirapan yung muscle mo. Mapagod yan. So, ang mangyayari niyan, si acetylcholine ay sinisira no? ng ating tinatawag na acetylcholinesterase. Okay? So, ang gagawin ni acetylcholinesterase, so, makikita mo yung mga acetylcholinesterase na yan dito sa synaptic cleft na to, dito sa space na to, at ang gagawin ng acetylcholinesterase ay ibibreakdown niya or ihahydrolyze niya <coughs> break so sisirain niya yung acetylcholine neurotransmitter na nandiyan sa synaptic cleft na yan so apag so isipin niyo kapag na, na-release ng mga synaptic vesicle yung acetylcholinesterase ang gagawin naman ng mga acetyl ay sorry yung mga acetylcholine pala gagawin ng mga acetylcholinesterase na nandito, ibibreak daw niya agad-agad, no? Yung neurotransmitter. Para hindi siya patuloy na mag-send ng signal down the drain. Okay ba? So, ibibreak daw niya si acetylcholine into acetic acid. Malamang acetylcholine yan at choline. Okay? So, ayun. Doon na-achieve yung relaxation. Ngayon, ang mga pwedeng uh, situational na tanong na itanong namin dyan sa exam. Sipin nyo, meron kang lason, kung wari, ba? Diba? Hindi ko lang umalam. May lason ka. Kung popper fish man yan, or venomous snake, may lason. Sabihin natin, may lason. Ngayon, it troubleshoot nyo to. Kung yung lason, ang tinatarget, ay yung vesicle, anong mangyayari? Magkocontract ba ba? O hindi pa magkocontract? Kung yung lason, ang tinatarget, yung receptor dito, magkocontract kokontrak pa ba or hindi? Kung yung lason, ang tinatarget yung transporter dito, yung pag-pump back ng calcium, magkokontrak pa ba or mag-relax pa ba? Mga ganyan. Or kapag yung lason, ang target ay yung ryanodine, no? receptors, yung foot proteins, yung ryanodine, dihydropyridine receptors na nandyan, magkokontrak pa ba or wala. So, ganun yung mga isipin yung analysis na questions na pwedeng madulot ng uh, troubleshooting ng ating uh, contraction process. So, napakaganda, napaka, ito yung pinakamagandang application ng physiology at ng, <coughs> ng ano, ng bio-100 portion, lalo na sa zoology portion. Napakaganda nito. Kasi, yan na, may actual na totoo na hihari, no? yung mga venomous snake, yung mga kamandag nila, may tina-target talaga na patuloy kang magko-contract, no? magko-convulse ka na lang kasi nga patuloy nagsasend ng action potentials down the transduction pathway. Meron naman na hindi ka na magko-contract kasi nga ini-inhibit niya yung mga receptors, mga ganyan. So may iba't ibang laso, mapa black widow spider, mapa mapa mga microbes na magko-cause ng botulism at mga ganun. Mga ganun yung iisipin nyo. So, kailangan nyo maisaulo yung entire process ng contraction, yung signal transduction pathway niya para masagot nyo yung mga ganun klaseng tanong. Okay ba? Okay? And I hope na you can process this information and I hope you have a key understanding on the entire mechanism of contraction with this lecture. A very short lecture indeed. And again, this is Sir Patrick. And thank you for staying with me throughout the lecture. See you again next time. Peace out.